And we welcome in Darlene Love. Lovely to have you in <laughs> Australia for a start. Yeah, it's really great to be here as Darlene Love and not as a uh, background singer for Dionne Warwick or Tom Jones or somebody. It's really great. Well, that's right. And, you know, we're going to discuss a lot of those names <laughs> over the course of this interview because you've worked with a lot of people. And you're in Australia uh, to work on fame at the moment. Right. And, uh, you know, how did you, you score that role? Uh, you know what? You never know. I tell be good to everybody because you never know where you're going to get a job yeah. from. Well, Kelly, the choreographer and director of Fame, was a good friend of the stage manager of Hairspray in New York. And mm -hmm. I did Hairspray for three years. And she came home. She's, she, she lives here. And when she came home, she told Kelly, if you guys do Fame, you need to hire Darlene Love. Now, we talking about in, in, in 2007, 2008, she wow. told her this. Mm. And when she got ready to do the play, she rung, rung up my um, um, agent. That's how I ended up getting this job. So Ms. Sherman, <laughs> was that a natural fit for you? Exactly, she yeah. really was. I'm such a, I'm a bossy pe yeah. person <laughs> about getting things done right. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not a mean person, <laughs> I'm a loving person, but a lot of times I don't want them to see that part of me because that's how they take advantage of you. Yeah. I'm talking about the children in class. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's a bit of a school teacher vibe about you, I guess. Yes, yeah. and probably because I have children that age mm -hmm. are and older uh, that I'm able to give that kind of attitude toward the children in, in class and thing. Yeah. Well, you've been a seasoned performer, haven't you, on Broadway over the years? Quite Greece. a few, yes. Uh, my first one was Leader of the Pack. Uh -huh. um, then I did Grease. And then I did the Fell, whatever you want to call it, Carrie. <laughs> I'm famous for doing a show that only lasted one performance. One performance? <laughs> so that doesn't qualify for a Tony because you're going to have... Eight at least, performances, at least eight, eight. Per, eight performances to qualify for a Tony. I learned that on 30 Rock. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me something I don't even know. We did one, we had about two weeks of previews, trying to straighten it out. Then we had one performance and we closed that day. Wow. That's I a, thought they were kidding when they said That's Guinness Book of Record stuff, isn't it? <laughs> I thought they were kidding when they said they could do that. So Carrie, as right. in like the old horror the movie. movie. How do you do a musical of Carrie? I think that's what happened. <laughs> One performance. <laughs> we tried. The music was great. We know yeah. we had a lot of fun. I did it for six months in London. Yeah. And then they brought half a London and half American crew to America to do it. And the critics hated it. I mean, not only did they hate it, yeah. they were trying to figure out what the hell was going on. <laughs> Like we were doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess with Leader of the Pack, that would have been great too, because that would have reconnected you with a lot of the songs that were around at the time you, you got your start. Yeah, most of the songs I did in Leader of the Pack were Darlene Love songs. Mm. Uh, uh, Today I Met the Boy I'm Gonna Marry, Do Run Run, He's Sure the Boy I Love, all of those songs were in Leader of the Pack, so I was actually playing Darlene Love. Mm. <laughs> well, there's so many great songs, you know, from that era. So it started off with The Blossoms. Right. 1980. 88? 88. No, 1968. Boy, I really jumped. Yeah. 1968. 68 or 58? 58. Yeah. Thank you. You yeah. know. <laughs> I'm thinking someone's shaving a few years off herself. Well, that's a whole lot of years, <laughs> jumping from the 50 to the 80. Yeah. Because I, I met them right out of high school, mm. the Blossoms, and uh, we started doing backup, backup uh, singing for uh, recording studios behind artists of every dimension you could ever think of, we did a lot of work. And that's how I got my uh, career actually started. Mm. James Darren actually was the first person we ever recorded for a backup session for Capitol Records. So right. that was the beginning of our long levity life in um, background singing. So uh, true or false, He's a Rebel by the Crystals is actually the Blossoms. Yes, that's, that's true? exactly right. Because Phil was upset with the Crystals who were in New York and I was in California and working for Phil Spector's partner at the time, who I did not know, it was Phil's partner, Lester Sill. And um, we um, were doing backup sessions for Lester, and Lester approached me and said that Phil is looking for a group to do this song that he knows is gonna be a monster hit. Mm. And uh, I said, yeah, right, and, and what else is new? <laughs> Everybody thinks their songs are gonna be hit records. And I uh, met Phil, and um, he actually taught me the song in the recording studio. And um, in a couple of days, we went into the studio and recorded 
he's a rebel. Right, but that must be bizarre that it came out as somebody else. Well, no, because what people don't realize, they were doing a lot of that back in the 50s and the 60s. Yeah. Uh, producers would hear, hear a hit song and they would call a background group in, as such as myself or whoever was doing background singing at the time, whether it be guys or, or girls. And uh, we got this song, we'll pay you double scale or we'll play triple scale and you go in and record it. And uh, the record would come out under a whole completely different name because the record would take off. Mm. And they needed somebody to go out and work the record to sell it. Mm. So I did a few of those. It's just that He's a Rebel ended up being such a big record. And the group, the Crystals, were already a group mm. in New York. So I think that that is probably what made that so big. Right. And, and you thought it all started with Millie Vanilli, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I say that all the time. <laughs> no, there was a lot of Millie Vanillis back in the day. Millie, Millie, whatever. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> do, do Ron, 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 do Ron, Ron. That's your voice. <laughs> that's right. Yeah? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about the first time you heard that song. Did it just seem like, wow, this is going to be a... No, future. none of those songs felt like they were going to be great songs. Yeah. Uh, probably because we called them bubblegum songs. Mm. Uh, and the sessions were great. That, that wasn't the problems. We just thought those little, cutie little songs wouldn't like really make it. And um, actually, I had recorded Do Run Run, and that's during the time where Men Fell was, Phil Spector was arguing back and forth about a record contract. And uh, he hadn't signed me on the on the recording contract yet, and I said okay. Went into the studio and we started recording the song. And um, I told him, well, you know, I can't do another record for you and not be on the contract. I mean, you've already proven to me you can have hit records, so I'd be kind of stupid to go back and do another record for you mm -hmm. and not be on the contract. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we went back in. Uh, he. Well, we had the falling out over Do Run Run. I left the studio, and he brought Lala Brooks, the Crystals, a lead singer of the Crystals, and put her voice over mine. Mm. You know, tried to make her sound and note for note what I had did already. And uh, that's the reason why um, her voice is actually on Do Run Run also, mm. along with mine. Mm. Phil is, you know, as uh, you know, quite newsworthy as as we've noted in in uh, recent years. Uh, how closely did you follow that court case? Too close. Mm. <laughs> I had, um, I arrived in Los Angeles the day he got arrested, uh, when, the day it all happened, so I didn't know anything about it. It's funny because when you hear somebody's name like that on the news all the time, you think that they've died mm. because they're always talking about, you know, uh, so-and-so did this and I didn't know the whole story, what was going on. Then I found out that, uh, uh, the, uh, the murderer had taken place, uh, Lana Clarkson had been mm. shot. And um, then they started calling my agents and my manager and they found out I was in Los Angeles. And they thought, perfect. So I got all these media calls. You know, I was on television, I think, every day, probably for two weeks, mm. with people doing interviews. And then, you know how they'll slice up the interview mm. and put it with something else or put it with another story. And so that went on for about two weeks. And then when the trial started, I was in, Los, in back in New York, and they have a television call, TV Court. And they had me on at least two or three times a week mm. talking about the case, what I thought about it. So I had to sort of follow what was going on. And I really felt bad for Phil. Uh, number one, I never thought that he killed her, if he did at that time, because he wasn't guilty yet. Uh, of maliciously murdering somebody because I don't think he, I know he wasn't that type of person. But Phil always fooled around with guns. He always pulled guns on people, you know, you know, playing or whatever. And I used to tell him years and years ago when he, fir when he first started doing that back in the 60s, one of these days you're going to hurt somebody and you're going to have to pay for it. And uh, so I think that was one of those times that he pulled out the gun and, and Things got back and forth, back and forth, or what happened, and I think that's why she ended up uh, dying, mm. because he was fooling around with guns. I don't play with guns. I don't allow them in my house. I don't, don't want to be around them, because guns don't kill. People kill. Mm. Somebody has to have their hand on that trigger, mm. you know, and I, I felt that Phil did it, but I, this, this was before he was found guilty or anything, but I didn't think that he did it maliciously or he intended to shoot her. Then more manslaughter. 
Exactly, mm. exactly. But because of how the trial came out, instead of them saying it was an accident or, you know, we were fooling around with the guns or whatever, he said that she was, that she committed suicide, yeah. which I went, excuse me, I go to your house, mm -hmm. uh, find a gun, <laughs> and then I come back and shoot myself yeah. for whatever reason. Mm. And uh, therefore, they didn't get him for manslaughter, they got him for murder. And now he's doing 20 years to life, yeah. which is really kind of unfortunate for his, for who he was to his life to end that way because he was very instrumental in the music business, you know, with the songs that he, he produced, you know. He, there'll never be another Phil Spector because he heard something back in the 60s that nobody else heard, mm. you know, and, uh, and we, you hope that that legend lives on not what actually, actually happened toward the end of his life. For sure. Well, I guess another great song that you recorded with him was uh, Christmas Baby Please Come Home, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Now that song I loved, mm. but I had no idea it would be around 40 years <laughs> later. <laughs> it's almost like it's a classic. Well, it is. It's like a classic It's a Christmas, Christmas classic, song. yeah. And, and then you got to sing with you too when they recorded yes, their version exactly. of it. Exactly. They wanted me to do all the, I did all the background for it. Yeah. Uh, and there are a lot of other entertainers who have recorded Christmas Baby Please Come Home. And, and I felt it was really great for me to hear their version because it sounds just like mm -hmm. mine. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't change it except for you too. They did change it. But Cher's version sounds just like mine, you know. Uh, and the, the other singers that, uh, that sung it, it sounds just like my vocals, just their voice. Yeah, I guess it's one of those songs that you can't really fool around with, can you? No, you know, and I say that all the time. If it's a great song, a great melody, you can't improve on greatness. You just sing it. And I'm not saying because my version was so great, it's just it was a great melody when Phil Spector, Ellie Greenwich, and Jeff Berry wrote it, you know, just sing the song. Yeah. You know. Well, jump jump back a bit before the Phil Spector days. Uh, Bobby Bobby Socks and on, the Bobby, Blue Jeans. Hang on, Bobby Socks <laughs> and the Blue Jeans. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah. That was another one. You know, I was telling you about being part of a group and you're not yeah. really. Yeah. Phil came up with this song, uh, Zippity Doo Dah, and he said he thought it was going to be a great song. We went Zippity Doo Dah. <laughs> you mean the song from you know Burr Rabbit, the yeah. Song of the South, that song? And he said yes. We didn't have a group then. It was just the Blossoms, and he found this guy, was a friend of his, and they um, brought him in, and we just started. There was no group when we recorded that song. Mm. And then he came up with this idea as well. Why don't you guys call yourself Bobby Socks and the Blue <laughs> Jeans? And we were all wearing blue jeans during that time. They yeah. called them blue jeans, and we did wear Bobby Socks. Mm. Uh, so Phil came up with the name Bobby Socks and the Blue Jeans. And uh, that's obviously why there's never been a Bobby Socks and the Blue Jeans Greatest Hits album, because it <laughs> never went past that, really, did it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it never did, never yeah. did. The, the Greatest Hit single. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. We had a couple, uh, Why Do Lovers Break Each Other's Heart? Mm -hmm. But it was my voice. Mm. You know, it wasn't Bobby's. It was, uh, Bobby voice was the only voice that was on uh, Zippity Doo Dah, but other than that, it was all Darling Love and the Blossoms. Mm. So he intermingled all of that stuff with the Blossoms, mm. you know, with the Crystals, the Ronettes, even it's Ronnie and the Ronettes singing their stuff, but a lot of times we did their background too, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, other than that, uh, it was those groups where he heard these great songs and he wanted to do them, let's make a group, mm. you know. And like you said, one hit wonders, and where are they today? <laughs> <laughs> in Australia in fame. <laughs> yeah. What about uh, working with Elvis? How was that? That was probably a dream come true that you never think would happen. You know, boy, you know, you have people you say, boy, I wish I could sing behind. I wish I could sing behind. Well, we always thought about singing behind Elvis, but how in the world would we sing behind Elvis? Mm. Elvis at the time was still doing movies. And his background mostly were albums that he used the Jordanaires behind. But then the 1968 comeback special came along, mm -hmm. and um, the Blossoms were singing with another group of people. They put us in the choir to make it to fill the choir out to make it sound more black. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elvis met us, and he fell in love with us. We fell in love with him because we had a, a relationship where gospel singing was was connected and he loved gospel singing and so did I my background was gospel so we'd run off you know they'd give us 30 minute break or hour break he'd go get his guitar and we'd all be in a corner in a room and he'd be jamming on his guitar and we'd be doing gospel singing so that was even icing on the cake the dessert <laughs> everything piled in on one that we're actually sitting one-on-one -on -one just like you and I are yeah. 
just talking and having fun. Um, that was during the time we were filming the comeback special. And uh, he came up with the idea, I want the blossoms in the gospel segment of, of the video. Mm. And uh, that's another thing that happened that we didn't have no, no idea it was going to do. And then we did a movie with him, Change of Habit, because it had a gospel <laughs> segment in it that he wanted us to be in it. So God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> <laughs> How close did you get to Elvis? Uh, Were you really good friends? Well, no, because, you know, there's that gulf between you uh, because of the people, naturally, that are around Elvis more so than we probably could have got along much better, but because of who Elvis Presley was and who we were, there was no chance that we'd get to be buddy buddies or the phone, hello, how you doing, what's going on next week, you know. Uh, we got to be friends during the time we worked together, and that was, that was it. Mm. That was enough for me. That was a lifetime. <laughs> Throw it over to the British Empire. Sir Tom Jones. Ah. You know, if you married, married him, you'd, you'd be Lady Darlene now, He's a you? sir now? He's a sir, He yeah. was knighted. Yeah. Oh, my God. Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I don't think I would have ever married Tom Jones. <laughs> Being with Tom Jones on the road for two years, I don't think you would want to be married to Tom Jones. Yeah. Um, he was a great guy, though. He uh, a voice that only God could give you. He's very friendly, good guy, and a little uh, in in uh, what do you call the word when you when you like kind of shy, you know. He's a bit introvert. Believe it or not, yeah. he was. He was Tom Jones on stage and a little introverted when uh, it was a one-on-one -on -one thing, but. Uh, we got to know him very well because we were uh, with him for almost two years. When was that? Um, 71 mm. uh, to 72. And he had his own plane back in those days where he leased a, a plane from uh, United Airlines. And um, we all rode on this plane. He had a whole orchestra during that time. So it was the orchestra, it was us. He had a comedian who was on the show. So we all flew everywhere together. So we were together quite a bit. So we got to know each other pretty good. Wow, that's quite a lifestyle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you flew to Australia on your own private jet as well, of course, yes. didn't you? Yes, sure. Yes, uh -huh. yes. yes, John Travolta was the pilot. <laughs> Um, Aretha Franklin uh, you work with as well. Yeah, and I've known Aretha since she was 16 years old. Wow. Because of the gospel background. Her, mm -hmm. She used to work with her father all the time. Um, and she traveled on the road with him, L. Franklin. And uh, we, we used to go to a lot of their, their programs, and that's how I got to meet her. And when she, before she even thought about, I guess, going uh, secular when she was singing gospel. So we got to be good friends, too. Of course, this all pales into significance, doesn't it? Because I mean, I'm sure the highlight was appearing in a Mel Gibson movie. It was because that was a shock to me. Uh, <laughs> Lethal I was, Weapon, we're talking about. Right, I Miss, was, Mrs. Danny Glover. <laughs> <laughs> I was never known to be an actor. You know, I was a singer, and um, they saw me performing in in New York, and. Um, the casting director asked me if I would like to be in a movie with Danny Glover and Mel Gibson. I said, yeah, really? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Why not? And that's actually how it happened. And uh, there we were, four lethal weapons later, and I did all four of them, as you said, as Mrs. Danny Glover's wife. <laughs> so what, do you have the box set at home? I certainly do. Yeah. <laughs> Brings and it I'll out every time have somebody it. comes around. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny because all my friends know me so well, and I'm very close knit with most of my friends because they're not in the business. Mm. And uh, when I'm home and we can hang out, we don't talk about the business unless I'm just like when I get back home from Australia, we'll talk a lot about that. But other than that, it's less darling. Yeah. You know. <laughs> She's back. I'm <laughs> right, right, uh, right. There was a song in Home Alone too, I think. Yes, uh, Home Alone. Home Alone. Yes. First uh, movie. Yes, mm. and um, they wanted me to do Christmas Baby Please Come Home when, the, when they were doing the soundtrack, and I refused. I'm not making another dime for Phil Spector. I'm not getting royalties. I'm not making it. So we called Steve Van Zandt, who uh, was with Bruce Springsteen, and asked him if he could write another song. 
uh, like Christmas baby, please come home. And as he said, that's a good giant task. But uh, he did. He did himself proud, you know, with All Alone at Christmas. Mm. It's a great song. And was that the start of the relationship with, uh, with Steve to Bruce and then, you know, getting onto the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nomination here and you performing with Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band? You know, my life is like this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a fish, you know, it just keeps going, waving, yeah. waving, waving. I met Steve and Bruce uh, back in the, the 70s, uh, well, 80s, really. And um, he came to see me at a show uh, in Los Angeles, and he brought Bruce Springsteen with him. And uh, I was doing a song in the show called Hungry Heart. I always loved that mm. song by Bruce. And they were knocked out that I was singing that song and my version of it, they loved it. And uh, Steve Van Zant called me, said, you need to be in New York working. I said, I'd love to go to New York and work, but I don't know anybody there. I don't know how to get there. You know, people think it's really easy to like start here and just like, let's go to New York and have a career. <laughs> it's not that way. And Steve said, listen, I'll make some calls and uh, see what I can do. Well, the first job he got me was a job at a club called The Bottom Line, and the producer was Alan Pepper, who owned The Bottom Line in, in New York City. And then he got me another job at the Peppermint Lounge that was still going strong at the time. And uh, those two jobs led to me moving <laughs> to, to New York City. And today, actually, out of all the people that I've known and met over the years, uh, Steve Van Zandt and I are still, still very close, on the phone very close. Darlene, I got another gig for you close, you know. <laughs> Come and do this for me, would you, Steve? And today, and that's what led up to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I uh, got, my agent got a call from Bruce Springsteen's uh, manager and said, uh, Bruce wants Darlene to be on the concert. And I was wondering, I said, how can I get on this show? I need to be on this show. Maybe this will get me into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I get that call, yeah. and uh, I said, Lord, I guess you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, about five or six days before we're getting ready to perform, I didn't know what we were going to sing. And I'm going, uh, can somebody tell me what we're going to do? We're going to be in front of millions of people. I don't know what song I'm singing. So about four days before, um, we did the show at the Garden in Man uh, uh, Madison Square Garden in New York. They call and say they want to do Fine, Fine Boy and uh, Do Run, Run. I went, okay, Do Run, Run, Fine. But Fine, Fine Boy, I haven't sung in about 20 years. Mm. <laughs> so, of course, I pulled that boy out and had to really <laughs> start learning it all over again. And then I found out that Bruce does that song in his show, uh -huh. but he calls it a Fine, Fine Girl. Uh -huh. So it's like one of his favorite Phil Spector songs. So, I mean, I couldn't have asked, I couldn't have planned that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just, that just worked out perfectly. That's one hell of a backing band as well, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> ah, if I could afford each one of them when I worked, yeah. I would hire them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they would have to do me a big favor <laughs> if they worked for me. <laughs> so, obviously, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nomination means a lot. Yes, it really does. Uh, not just because it's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but I feel that I have really giving a lot to rock and roll. Um, I came up in its infancy uh, along with Phil Spector. Phil Spector wrote some great rock and roll songs and not only from other people. I've heard from people like Bruce and from Elton John who say as far as rock and roll is concerned we started it, Phil Spector. And my name is really linked closely with Phil Spector's name. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that I've been able to keep on growing keep on moving ahead with my life, doing things like movies, Broadway, mm. television. And not only do I feel I should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, a lot of my contemporaries also feel that I should be there. And it's gonna happen, it's just a matter of time, you know. Um, they, they claim I missed it by three votes, yeah. whatever that means. <laughs> three votes I missed it by. So, who knows, next year. You know, like Bruce and uh, Steve said, you know, you'll get in next year. Yeah, it'll happen. It'll happen. <laughs> it'll happen. It'll yeah. happen. Well, I think we've covered off uh, 52 years from the blossoms through to fame here <laughs> in less than half an hour, which is pretty amazing. Right. It's uh, great to have her in here. Mrs. Danny Glover, I beg your pardon, um, Darlene Love. <laughs>